Hey, everybody. Good to see you. I am Lee Kelso. This is Sob Talk Live, the show by two guys who own Sobs, four guys who love Sobs. We're glad to have you here with us. Hey, I'm Mark Romitra here coming to you uh, Thursday evening. We're going to talk tonight about a couple different topics, uh, one of which is going to be brand new Saab enthusiast ownership. We're going to be talking about uh, a young uh, and upcoming people who are interested in Saab. We're going to be trying to talk about uh, what the pitfalls and uh, caveats of that uh, journey is. You bet. And we're going to get started by letting you know that next week have kind of a special guest lined up. Hope to get him this week, but it just didn't work out. Tom Donnie from the uh, Saab Museum out in Sturgis, South Dakota, is going to be our guest next week. And he couldn't be here this week. And, and let me show you why. Tom is uh, currently driving <laughs> from his home to Sturgis in this 9,000 towing that camper behind him there. And that is actually a Saab product as well. It's called the Saab O, uh, the camper behind that, that Saab 9,000 there. Um, and uh, it is a product that Saab made for, well, you know, a couple of years at least. Kind of an interesting story behind that that Tom will tell us next week about uh, how some engineers in the uh, helicopter assembly division of Saab kind of went off and did their own thing. and. And this is the result. And Mark, you know, I, I've been interested in these crazy things, the Topola or Topola. Uh, these were campers that Saab built to, you lift the, the hatchback off a 99 or a 900 and drop this in. And you've got room for the family to go camping. There's a little uh, little uh, cooktop in there and mm -hmm. uh, space for sleeping. I think there's even some running water provisions. So we'll learn a lot more about all of that kind of stuff going yeah, that forward. That sounds exciting. I want to find somebody who knows something about these things. And uh, I don't know, it seems kind of wild. How practical, though, I guess in 30 minutes, you can convert your Saab 900 into a camper. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? That's good stuff right there. Yeah. And the other thing, you know, Tom asked me, uh, since he couldn't be here, if we could do him a favor. And uh, if anybody's watching who is interested in lending a hand, uh, Saab also made boats. They made these little aluminum rowboats who and, thought uh, yeah who thought and uh so tom ha found this one in sweden and it was sent over and uh it's now on the shore in delaware somewhere and tom said he's looking for somebody to volunteer to pick this thing up in delaware and uh, drive it to south dakota or somehow get it to south dakota so you can see uh, you know from uh, uh the size standpoint it's not all that big it's pretty lightweight yeah, uh, but uh, interesting. Speaking of lightweight, it is actually made of aircraft grade aluminum, from what I understand. Yeah, exactly. So it's definitely light. It's small. So apparently you can fit into a back of a reasonable sized minivan or truck or maybe even on top of a roof rack for some lucky Saab, <laughs> Saab driver to take with them. So you can see right there, it does fit in the back of a van. So if you're interested, if you if you if you want to lend a hand and help Tom get this thing to the museum, uh, just uh, hit us up either on Facebook or uh, YouTube and shoot us a message. We'll get you back to Tom and get the contact information put together. Oh, I wanted to show you this. Hang on real quick here. Um, and there is the Saab label on this little rowboat. Isn't that cool? Look at the old Saab logo. Yeah, that's incredible. Isn't that neat? Yeah, ah. Who knew? All those crazy things that Saab Things did. you learn. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, um, last week we uh, talked about a number of things, and um, one of them was, um, here we are. Uh, we, we talked about Saab ownership, right? And uh, so right. a viewer um, hit my uh, YouTube channel uh, and watched our episode and then posted this question. Hey, I'm 16. I really like Saab. My dad doesn't want me to get one because it's unreliable but I don't care because they look so cool. I wanted to get one. Which Saab should I get? Well, I posted that out on Facebook and just to kind of let people start to comment. It was really pretty interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. here, are, here are some of the comments. You can just read them for yourself. But what do you think about that? Mark, is a, a Saab a good car? First car for a 16-year-old? Is dad right? Are they too unreliable? There are a lot of questions that need answering. So you're 16 years old and you're looking for your first car the Saab vehicle depending on what you get um, is going to be all dependent on a lot of resources 
um, a lot of knowledge, um, community engagement, how well, how much support you have, because at least this one particular 16 year old, uh, they're looking at this vehicle as their first car, turbocharged, it's fun. We all love them, so we're biased, but for oh, there's a lot of people out there that just aren't familiar with Saab and there's a lot of concerns there about the reputation of them being unreliable I think more so that people just don't know that it's a matter of maintenance it's a matter of you know taking care of these vehicles and that's good you know that's across any um, platform as far as a first car if you're looking for a first Saab a lot of different opinions there personally I think a 9.5 would be a good first choice, especially in the 2004, 2005, and newer. Mm -hmm. um, they were there were a lot of earlier issues that they had um, essentially fixed at that time, and also you'll find that um, there are more parts available for the 9.5s um, still that you can get your hands on. You know, typical stuff like you know brake pads and maintenance stuff like that. Uh, still fairly available, so that would yeah, be. The so what do you think, though, about should should he go with the V6 or the turbo? Where, where where would you start? I would say, well, in the 9.5, I would say uh, I would lean more towards the um, the four cylinder 2.3 liter, simply because it has a timing chain versus the V6 having a timing belt, uh -huh. and I know that the timing belts are. An item that needs to be replaced more often, and you usually have to take those to a shop to get those done. Um, and from a 16-year-old's perspective, um, when you're looking at what's going to be a lesser expensive cost of ownership, because there's, you know, when you're 16 years old, you got to think about if this is going to be my first car, you know, am I going to have to get that, get a job to go ahead and help support the vehicle? Am I going to get, you know, help from parents, stuff like that? So. A lot of these, you know, questions kind of come into play. I would say that the four-cylinder would be at least a more robust choice, at least when it's first starting out, because I know there's a lot more support for it. And um, I know that the, from a reliability standpoint, I think the timing chain driven four-cylinder is more reliable just from the fact that it does have a timing chain versus a timing belt versus the V6 and those Saab 95s. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of on board with you on that one, mm -hmm. you know, and certainly don't uh, the, the newest of the Saab 900 classics is 27 years old. So that's automatically out for me. Yeah. And I think you're probably right. You know, a 9.5 is probably the most modern one that you're going to be able to get into. A lot of car for a young kid, though. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, that's there's a lot going on in that car. I would not shy away any young person from the Saab ownership experience. Um, it's just a matter of circumstance and how well that journey goes. Um, I'm I am kind of privy myself to uh, wagons, so if if I had the choice, I'd, I'd steer people towards a wagon. That's just my thing, but I know they're fun um, and utilitarian. That's the best part. Um, I know a few friends that make full use of their Saab wagons, especially when going, you know, shopping for items at thrift stores or going to certain mm -hmm. junkyards looking for extra parts and wagons are just so nice to have. <laughs> so here's Richard Hassel disagreeing with me. I'm saying, yeah, I don't get a 900, but he's, he's, he's thinking that's probably a good place to start. You know, they're pretty darn reliable once you get them running and set up. I mean, the engines right. are pretty bulletproof, but uh, boy, you know, um, well, the problem I have is so many mechanics look at them and think, oh, you know, God, those sobs are so weird. There's no, they're right. really not. I mean, other than the fact that in the old cars, at least, that the oil pan is part of the transmission and how mm -hmm. that all goes together. Right. Otherwise, they're pretty much, you know, standard stuff, I think, largely, aren't they? This brings up a good point. So if you have a young person that's looking to get into a saw for the first time, the biggest question is going to be whether that young person is going to work on the car themselves and put in that um, effort to learn how to work on themselves because financially that's going to make a lot of benefit if you're able to work on your own vehicle, you know, yeah. through either getting knowledge online or community support, stuff like that. If you're in a position where you're going to be relying on a mechanic to work on the vehicle for you, that changes the dynamic that pretty much says, okay, 
how expensive are parts? You know, how many people are out there that work on these cars? You know, those types of questions do come up. Sure, you could take your, you know, Toyota or Honda over to the local dealership, and there's plenty of places around that work on those. But Saabs, it's unfortunate, but as rare as they are these days, there are less and less mechanics that do actually work in these Saabs. And that right there is a big factor for some people because they don't feel comfortable working on the vehicles themselves. They would prefer taking them to a mechanic. And in this day and age, unfortunately, there are less mechanics that work on Saabs. Yeah, true. So true. And, you know, um, we don't do ourselves any favor when we we joke about um, Saab means something almost always broken. I mean, you know, it's a little joke amongst us, but yeah, we, it doesn't really help out there in the general public. So, <laughs> yeah, what Richard is saying, yeah, it's true. One thousand percent. He is so right. You know, you've got to be you got to be ready to twist a wrench or or. Uh, or your ownership experience is going to be a little bit different. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that that kind of brings me to, you know, most of the big talking points. If you have a young person that's looking to get into Saab for the first time, definitely considerations there. Um, that's going to be a, that's essentially going to be a discussion with the parents and so forth and see how they feel maybe a little bit of rebelliousness going on there that's fine young people go through that perfectly normal um but having the support there from the community and helping that journey go well um that's all going to be part of the experience and i think we have a strong community and i think we can i think we can definitely help out young people who are interested and in hopefully uh, have a good uh, ownership experience you know and and these cars are fun to play with and tweak and there's a lot of stuff that you can kind of play with and uh, modifications you can make to kind of make it your own. So I think that's a good thing about having an older car like that. Actually, speaking of modifications, once you own a Saab, there are definitely choices there to help enhance the experience, especially if you happen to have a manual Saab. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard from a bunch of guys that manuals are great. I've had the pleasure of driving a few myself. And actually, if I recall correctly, you, Lee, actually put in uh, a manual upgrade for your Saab 900 um, mm -hmm. that's going to help you uh, shift a little bit faster, a little bit quicker, maybe give you a little bit of more, uh, a little bit more race car experience when you're going down the road. Can you tell us more about that? I don't know. I'd call it a, a race car experience. <laughs> but yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I started, uh, you know, we had Jordan Pagano for Modern Classic Sobs on the show a few weeks ago. And, uh, and, Jordan uh, surprised us with uh, after we had discussed interest in in short throw, um, he started producing a short throw shifter kit, and so of course I bought one right away, and um, and and so here I am showing there's the sh the old shifter out of my car, and uh, the shiny new one that Jordan produced out of some cast aluminum, and the and the deal here is. Um, man it, it just felt so great uh having a very precise shifter and it's called um a short throw for a specific reason and let me bring this up because i thought this was really significant so mm -hmm. somebody watched I, I you know of course did a video on my youtube channel about uh, how that installation went and show you how to do it if you want to jump in uh, it's really pretty simple it took you know maybe 45 minutes an hour tops pretty simple mm -hmm. uh and uh vincent suart swart uh jumped in and said hey so what is exactly short about a short shifter is it shorter throws is it a naming thing that somebody once said it's stuck or is there something shorter and there truly is now in my case uh the feel of that shifter is just so much more precise and solid than the sloppy wet noodle thing that had been in my car but mark you took a look into the science behind this and can explain this a little better right yeah so what a short shifter will do is allow you to shift between the gears much more quickly and how it achieves this is that it makes it so that the travel of the actual gear shift is shorter based on the geometry of the actual shifter itself so what it does is it makes it so that there is more leverage um, past that pivot point when you shift your gear and you move that lever to shift in different gear you're actually having a, sh a, a quicker experience at your hand. And then it's also going for 
It's also going for a, a quicker shift experience from first to second, fourth to fifth, and so on and so forth. So it's actually um, it's actually moving it uh, uh, less between shifts, and it makes it quicker. So that means you can get into the gears quicker, and it has a much better feel, as Lee just described. Yeah, and you know, in my case, in the one that Jordan made, and uh, he said he's he's kind of sold out of the current run, but he's got more in process, so um, there won't be a delay if you want to order one. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Jason is jumping in here with a comment. Let me show you this. Let's travel the shift lever. So the gears change quicker. And as Mark yep. just described, yeah, you, you move the shift lever less, but where you place that, that fulcrum point changes the, the throw on the bottom. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, a simple little change. I mean, the difference in mine is, is not f large at all, but, uh, Jordan's engineered it so that it's, a uh, very effective change and just having that, having a new modern bearing that's, that's Teflon lined and other things just took the sloppy mm -hmm. sloppiness out of my shifting experience. It was, uh, man, I think it was the, uh, I think I, I think I phrased it in the YouTube channel, uh, the, uh, lowest effort, highest return upgrade I've made in that car in a long time. Yeah. Uh, definitely. And you know what, Mark, I didn't know this, but, uh, Look at that for all you nine five guys, the modern sobs, they're out there for you too. Absolutely. I'm I'm glad to see it is is out there. Looks like Genuine Sob has some more products to go ahead and make your sobs even a little bit better. But that's good news for everyone all around. I know that there are nine uh, hundreds, and now I know for the nine fives, that's really good products. Yeah. So uh if if you're interested in um in changing your experience in a manual sob uh yeah a short shifter certainly gets my endorsement and of course jordan gets my endorsement for uh for producing just a really great product it uh slick looking shifter and i think it's on his website you can go to modern classic sob and you'll find them there mm -hmm. so uh we've had um We've had uh, hundreds of people now watching the, the playback of our videos here, our live streams, mm -hmm. Mark, and it's been great. I love all the comments from everybody. Oh, we yeah. uh, read and answer every one of them. I'd love to hear from you guys if you're interested in what you want to see on future episodes. Always very interested to hear about that. Um, working on a couple of things. Of course, I said Tom Donnie is going to be with us next week. Uh, he's the guy who really created the uh, Saab Museum out in Sturgis, South Dakota. Uh, also working on uh, understanding um, classic car insurance. There's a lot of restrictions and a lot of a lot of rules to that game. You got to follow if you're going to insure your car as a classic, so you can get the most out of it in case of an accident. So we've got that coming up, and just a lot of other things. But as always, if you have a topic, we'd love to hear about it. Right? Absolutely. We're here every Thursday, 8 p.m. And we want to hear from our community. Definitely want to get new ideas. And we want to talk about all the topics that are important to you guys. Because really, you know, we need to go ahead and share the information. We're trying to keep that enthusiasm alive. And, you know, we want to share that with everyone we can. So definitely want to get all the ideas out there. And we want to share, share it all. All right. That's it for this week. Hey, Mark, we'll see you next week. And uh, we will be in touch with all of you answering all your questions. And again, if you want to help out Tom Donnie and uh, get that boat from <laughs> Delaware to South Dakota, uh, just hit us up. We'll let you know how to do that. Hey, Mark, have a good week. All right. Have a good week, everyone.